Welcome to Art Starts Explores, our province of play. My name is Kay Slater, and I'm the gallery coordinator and preparator at Art Starts in Schools. Every month, we pick a new theme to explore together through art making and play. In these workshops, you can watch along any time you have time to make, or listen, or just watch. We encourage young people, families, and creative people of all ages to join us every week on Saturdays at 11 a.m. as we release a new episode. These videos are for you. Whether you want to join us on Saturday when they become available or any time you want to make. We're so glad you're watching. Have you missed a week? Check out artstarts.com slash explores dash online or any of our videos on YouTube or Facebook to check out an episode you've missed. Okay, let's explore together. Before we begin making, let's review the three rules of explores. We've got rules in quotes here because they're less rules and more like guidelines or things that we like to have in mind before we start making together. First is respect. We practice respect for ourselves by checking in with ourselves every day before we start making. Maybe we didn't have a good night's sleep or we're feeling really good today. Whatever it is, we want to take the time to check in with ourselves. We also practice respect by doing the same thing for each other. And if we're not making alone, we're making with other grown-ups, or other youth, or friends, or classmates. We want to practice respect by asking them how they're feeling as well, so we can be mindful of each other while we make together. Another way we practice respect is with our tools. That can be about putting them away when we're all finished or using them safely. If somebody else is waiting for a turn to use a tool, we can use our words or our signs and share. We can respect each other by asking how long they'll need the tool so we can move on to something else, or if we need it now, we can let them know when we will be done and tell them we will pass them the tool when we're finished. We can also practice respect by acknowledging the land. So this space that you see here is my studio space. And I'm on the stolen or unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations as an uninvited guest on these lands. One of the ways I practice respect is by acknowledging where I'm coming from and to be respectful of the lands, waters, and to the indigenous people who are here and who have been here since time immemorial while I have access to these lands. You can practice respect by finding out the territories and lands where you are watching and making from today, and by being the best guest you can and respecting the host nations, the lands, and waterways where you live. The second rule is that nothing is for keeps. I encourage you whenever possible to take things from the recycling bin. You can take paper that's already been drawn on or has writing on the back or is ripped and then you don't have to feel worried about ripping it up yourself or crumpling it or just trying something out. It doesn't have to be good or perfect the first time because it's not for keeps. And when we're all finished, I encourage you to take it apart. That helps really make it so that it isn't for keeps. Because if you know you're going to take it apart at the end, you don't have to make any finished thing. You can try all the things and ways of making. Our last rule is no expectations. If we're not expecting something to turn out good, or even to turn out bad, we're open to it going in a whole bunch of different ways. And that means that all respectful and creative ideas are good regardless of what happens after we try something. If you already know how something is going to turn out, if you've done it before, we can be open to trying something completely new and practice surprise. And if it doesn't turn out, that's okay. It's not for keeps. These are the three rules that we like to keep in mind when we explore together every week. Okay, let's get making together.
Hello everyone and welcome to Art Starts Explores. My name is Kay Slater and I'm the gallery coordinator and preparator at Art Starts in Schools. We're going to continue our exploration of shadows. If you explored with us the last two weeks, welcome back. If this is your first week exploring with us, we're happy to have you exploring. You can always go back and check out any of our previous episodes, either on the theme of shadows or any of our previous art making um, themes on our website at artstarts.com slash explorers dash online or on Facebook or YouTube. This week, we're going to continue exploring shadows, but this time we're going to play with drawing with shadows. To practice drawing with shadows, I've collected the following things. If you want to make along with me, that's great. If you want to just watch and get inspired to try these things out on your own later, that's great too. Do you have a light source? For us to create shadows, we need to have a darker space or a really powerful light source. In my studio space, I can turn off all the lights and I use a mobile device, which allows me to turn on the little um, flashlight to create a light source. But you could use anything. You could use a lamp. You could use a flashlight. You could even go outside in the sun and use the sun and different objects um, at the brightest part of the day. If you do go outside in the sun though, make sure you're taking care of yourself. Wear a hat, wear your sunscreen, and maybe don't go out at the hottest part of the day. Do you have any paper? If you've made with us before, you know I love going into my recycling bin and taking paper from the recycling bin. I've got an old envelope. I've got a paper bag. I've got a piece of paper that I drew on another time. And I've got some ripped newsprint. All of these are going to be great for exploring because everything that we're making and trying today isn't for keeps. So when we're all finished making, we can put our paper back into the recycling bin. Do you have any mark making tools? A mark making tool is anything that makes a mark. When I explore, I like to use markers because the contrast is higher. It's easier for you to see through my video when I use markers, but you can use anything that makes a mark. A pencil, crayons, pencil crayons, even pudding if you have permission. Anything that will make a mark on the page is great. And then lastly, we need some objects. We need things that we're going to be able to put onto our page that are going to cast a shadow. If you explored with us in previous weeks, we explored the idea of opacity, so how light travels through an object. When we stand in front of the sun and we, um, uh, on a, a bright sunny, sunny day, it casts a shadow because the sun can't penetrate through our body. Our bodies are opaque. We can make a dark shadow. If we have something that the light can go through, such as wax paper, but it doesn't create a really hard shadow, that's called a translucent object. Objects like windows or plastic wrap, where the light goes through almost 100%, those are called transparent. Any of those objects you can use today, but translucent and opaque objects are going to cast an easier shadow for us to draw. But anything you want to grab, any object is going to be great. Okay, let's start exploring drawing with shadows. I'm going to move some of these stickies to the side so we have a bit more space to work with. You know who I am. I'm going to move my light source. And you know what? I don't think I've drawn with a paper bag before. So I'm going to start with a paper bag. But you can start with whatever piece of paper you want have a bit more drawing space, I'm actually going to rip my paper bag.
because it was in the recycling bin, I don't have to feel bad about um, ripping my paper. It was already going to go out into the recycling. So I can rip it all I want. And I really do love to rip paper. Any excuse to rip paper is great for me. It doesn't matter that it's a perfect square. It doesn't matter that there's some writing on it. Nothing that we're trying today is for keeps. The objects that I grabbed from my studio was a salt shaker where there's glass, and I know that when the light goes through it, it's going to pass pretty transparently. But I've also tried using this in um, another making session, and some of the salt dust that's collected on the inside of the glass actually makes the light do really interesting things. I also have some stickers stuck to the outside of it, which also creates some shadows. I also found a, um, a clamp. And then I found two toys, a doll and a little bunny. And so these are the objects that I'm going to use to create some shadows while I'm drawing. I'm going to turn down the light in my studio, and then I'm going to set up my flashlight or light source. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to set my light source over here to the side. I've got a little piece of tape here to help it sit up. If you have a flashlight, it'll probably stay in place a little bit easier. Or if you're trying this outside in the sun, you could use some chalk on the sidewalk and then just position yourself how you want in relation to the sun. You know what? It doesn't really want to stand up. So I'm going to use my little host character. I'm going to put it here. There we go. So that my flashlight stays in place. Okay. Before I even get started, my paper, because it was ripped up and it re uh, previously had some creases, it already has some cool shadows. So if I wanted to, I could start by just starting to trace some of the shadows that my paper itself was making. I don't even need any special objects. Cool. Oh, I had another shadow over here. Oh, that I lost when I pressed it. So you can actually change the shadows as well, right? While you're moving your fingers across the page or page. Or if you want the shadows to be darker or lighter, you can move your fingers to get the kind of lines that you want. Oh, I think I'm going to add one here as well. There we go. So I've traced the shadows that the paper itself made. And I'm going to change colors so that when I turn the lights back on, I can see what different things uh, cast different shadows. Now I'm going to bring my little bunny character on the page. So to begin with, I bring it really, really close to the light source. And I notice that it casts a really big shadow. Trace my shadow. And there we go. What happens when I move my figure further away from the light. Trace it. Even further. The shadow got skinnier and smaller the further away the object was. But because it was kind of a fat and squat object, I never really got the ears. They're cast too far away. What happens if I move my light source back and leave my object in place? So I'm gonna place my object so that it sits in the same place as where I traced the shadow the first time. There we go. And now I'm gonna move my light source. Move it back this way. What happens? What do we notice? So if you have a lamp, that you can move, what do you notice? Well, as I move the light away, I notice that my paper bag actually has way more shadows than it had before, my crinkled paper. But my bunny didn't really change. It's almost in exactly the same spot. Is there a way that I can move my bunny so that I can get my ears to show up on the page? What if I go on the side? 
starting to see the bunny ears. What if I turn it upside down? Yeah, check that out. Okay, I'm going to trace that. And I lined it up with the body before. There we go. Cool. So by rotating an object, we're able to get different shadows that are cast on the page and can create these really interesting lines that we wouldn't expect. You know what? I actually really like this line too. I'm going to change colors. We go. Cool. And I'm going to keep going. Oh, my clip. Kind of similar when I put it in this way to the bunny ears. How can I move my clip? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Like this to get a completely different shape. So I'm going to change my color again so we can see what that shadow it casts compared to the other ones. So it's kind of got these teeth here. We get to slow down and actually really look at the shadow it casts. And then on the outside, keeps going over here. And then it has kind of this dip over here. Oh, and my finger is part of it as well because I have to hold down the clip. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it part of the shadow. No, I don't have to. Very cool. All right, I'm going to turn the light back on and see what I've discovered so far. Check it out. Do you remember what shadows made which lines? I think I started with the green marker for the lines that the paper made. Oh, and I think I used this one again for my clip over here. So these marks over here, those were the shadows. And you know what? I'm going to fill them in so that they're a little bit different than the last one that I used with the green. Now they really do look like shadows, right? Because now they're filled in dark. Because they're the dark part of the page when we put opaque objects in front of the light. It's okay that I color through them or color over other lines. We're just exploring what happens when we do these things. doesn't have to be perfect. I don't have to color inside the lines. That's okay. I think those were all the paper lines that I drew. So I've got my shadow lines from the paper. And then my bunny cast all of these kind of purpley. Oh, I think I, I used this blue one, the blue Sharpie. And so those were the large shadows when I held my bunny like this. It made that cone shape of the body. And then as I moved the bunny further up the page right here, this is the size that it made. And then when I moved the bunny up to here, this was the shadow it made. And then I wanted to have something a little bit different. And so I turned my bunny upside down. And this part here, I'm going to draw some lines so I can actually really, really tell the parts that I drew here. And there we go. So the bunny made this really interesting shape that doesn't really look like a bunny just by moving it around. Then I think I moved the bunny so that it was on its side so that the ear 
made one shadow here, and then the other ear and part of the body made this large piece here, which ended up really kind of looking like a hand. Pull this over, rotate the page because we don't have to keep the page in the same place. And check this out. If I was to take my, it's a really big thumb, but if I was to now trace the rest of my hand, kind of looks like a hand, which is really cool. Why would we do this? Why would we trace shadows? Well, the first thing is, is it, it's really just fun to see and to make permanent, to make a mark, something that isn't permanent. So what I mean by that is, is that when you stand in front of the light and cast a shadow, it can feel really real, it can feel really dark. It can feel really permanent while you're there. It exists, but then you move and the shadow is gone. That moment that you got to spend with that shadow was real and that shadow was uh, and that shadow was cool. But as soon as you move, it's gone. And what we call that in the art making world is a big word called ephemeral. Ephemeral. And basically it means it was there for a moment and now it's gone. It's not permanent. And so we learn when we're exploring ephemeral things to take a moment and really be happy and joyful or actually any emotion we feel when something happens that isn't permanent. We experience it and then we, we're changed by it, even if it doesn't stick around, even if it's not something that we can hold afterwards. By tracing shadows, we turn an intangible or something that we can't hold object, an ephemeral moment into something permanent, into something we can touch, into something we can hold, into something we can trace. And that's really kind of cool and beautiful. You get to take photographs of moments that you wouldn't normally um, keep and can be the beginning of a new uh, art exploration. I wouldn't have thought to trace my hand like this. Usually when I trace my hand, here, I'm going to use a really different color. Usually when I trace my hand, I extend all my fingers out and trace it like this. That's usually how I trace my hand. And so if somebody asked me to trace my hand, I would always trace it like this. It's something that I'm comfortable with. It's something that I do every time. But by starting with a shadow and having that line that made me think about my hand, I traced my, my hand in a completely different way. I tried something new because the shadow lines inspired me to see something different, inspired me or encouraged me to try something new. I might never draw a shape like this, but because I was able to look um, at, the, um, at the shadow and I drew this, as soon as the shadow was gone, I actually kind of see like some really green mountains here like a lot of trees here. And if there was, maybe this becomes a cloud. Yeah, I really like that. So I'm gonna change the color. So this is a cloud hanging over all of these trees and mountains here. Maybe there's an ocean here in front of the mountains. And I can keep going. I can add things as I start to see pictures that were started by my shadow. This can be a really fun way when you know you want to draw, but you can't think of what to draw. You want to spend some time with your markers or you want to spend some time drawing with your friend or your sibling or, or another adult. And they ask you, well, what do you want to draw? And you can't think of anything. Shadows are a great way of starting some lines without you really having to think about any one thing. And then once the lines are down on the paper, you can start looking at the lines to see what you see and see if you start to craft a picture based on those lines. My bunny line, I really ended up liking. And I know I'm drawing over top of um, each page, but that's okay because when we're just exploring, we don't, have to, we don't have to keep one picture. So this was the line that the bunny made.
even though this is a bunny, when I turn my page this way, I kind of see a person stretching their arms out really wide. And so I'm going to add some fingers to the end here. And then I'm going to add a happy face down here and maybe a bow tie because bow ties are cool. And maybe a t-shirt, that's where the t-shirt ends. And then maybe that's the bottom of their t-shirt. I might not have ever drawn a person And here. I'm going to grab another piece of paper here to the side. I might never have drawn a person that looks like this. If I hadn't tried it first by um, by using my my uh, rabbit, so by casting a shadow, it can be the start of an idea. It can let you try something new that you've never tried before, and that can be really hard just from scratch. When somebody says, "Try and draw something new in a way that you've never drawn before," well, how do you draw like you've never drawn before? By giving yourself a different starting point. It's still your lines. You are the one who decided to trace the lines that you that you traced when you put your objects in front of the light. So they're all your choices. But you didn't decide to draw a person when you were tracing or when I was I didn't decide to draw a person when I was tracing my bunny. It wasn't until I had the shape on the page that I saw the possibility of drawing this person with their arms all long like this. What did you find in the lines that you traced? If you don't find anything, that's okay. Grab a new piece of paper from the recycling bin. Grab some new objects. Move your light source around. Go outside and use the chalk, but move your body in different ways. If you can safely gather with a, a nibbling or a sibling or an adult or anyone else that's in um, your bubble that you can safely gather with outside in July, then take your chalk outside, trace each other, trace each other's shadows. You could dance or you could pose in one position and have somebody else trace your body and then you could switch. You could trace somebody else's body, they could move and then you could move around the shadow of the tracing to see what you see. It doesn't actually have to be an outline of another person anymore. It could be the start of some mountains. It could be the start of a favorite character or a cartoon character you've seen before. It could be a bear. It could be a dog. It could be a tree. What do you see in the lines when the shadow moves? when the shadow moves away and you can just pay attention to the lines and the marks that you've left behind. This is just one way to explore drawing with shadows. There are lots of different ways you can try. I hope you've enjoyed exploring shadows with me this month. I really enjoyed this. Remember, you can go back and check out our previous episodes on shadows on our website at artstarts.com slash explores dash online or on our Facebook page, or on YouTube. I'm going to leave my camera running for a little bit like I always like to do so that I can clean up my space so that we can be ready to make together next time. I'll see you soon. Bye for now. <laughs>